Welcome back to Talking Planning and today we're heading over to a new city to check out one of its biggest transport changes in decades and how its continued development can kickstart the growth of a modern suburb, provide connectivity to the city centre, make special events transport easier and help reduce congestion. Today we're heading to a city with a rabbit problem, decent street art, frickin' good chicken and... I feel like I'm missing something here. Oh yeah, it's also where the federal government is based, it's our nation's capital, and the quintessential destination for a school excursion. So, let's take a closer look at Canberra's Light Rail. Today's trip starts at Alinga Street, the southernmost stop, which is a short walk from the city interchange where you'll find bus services connecting across the ACT and into New South Wales to Queanbeyan, Yass and Murrum Bateman. Coaches are a little further afield at Canberra Civic. Around Olinga Street you might also spot some signs advertising stage 2 of the light rail, which is an extension to Woden. The ACT government even has a virtual engagement room which is an interesting way to do online engagement and is certainly worth checking out. It's a link down below. Now on board, you can see the full stopping pattern all the way from Gungalan to Alinga Street, which is a journey of about 25 minutes. I did the full trip a couple of times on my recent stay as Gungalan is an intriguing place to visit, especially as an urban planner, and the tram is a nice way to get there. There are also plenty of help points and clearly marked door releases on board, which is great to see. Stand clear. Pulling away from Alinga Street, I've grabbed a seat right by the rear door where you'll see the new Transport Canberra corporate seat fabric in both blue and red colour schemes. It's professional looking, but not too plain, and tastefully incorporates elements of Indigenous design. Many other operators could learn a thing or two here. The seats fitted are divided plastic buckets with a reasonable seat cushion, providing decent support, but you won't sink into them the same way that you would with a well padded bus bench seat. Still, for a 25 minute journey, they're pretty decent and you certainly won't feel uncomfortable or sore. If you're wondering why these trams bear a passing resemblance to Newcastle's or the ones currently out of service that were used on the L1 Dulwich Hill line, it's because they are the same overall type CAF Urbos 100s. The next stop is Alora Street. Upon arrival, please exit. Unlike Newcastle, Canberra chose to stick with traditional overhead power rather than supercapacitors and flash charging. Hopefully, these Urbos 100s managed to escape the cracked bogey box issues that have been observed on Esconson, West Midlands and the Sydney light rail fleet. So, while we're heading along, let's have a quick listen now. Moving round the interior a little more, these trams are designed with multimodal journeys in mind, with bicycle storage space, now departing Alinga Street. accessible seating, and decent sized information displays throughout the tram. The intercarriage dividers are also pretty slim, which helps to keep the interior feeling light and airy. Please exit from the left hand side doors. The next stop is Alinga Street. 
Canberra's history as a planned city is rather unique amongst Australian cities, taking inspiration from the Garden City movement and, of course, the involvement of American architect Walter Burley Griffin as the winner of a design competition for the nation's new capital, thanks to Sydney and Melbourne's inability to settle their differences. Burley Griffin's design was heavily influential on the centre of Canberra, but further growth has been heavily regulated and developed by the National Capital Authority, with land typically under leasehold rather than freehold arrangements. Interestingly, Canberra is also only joined by the Gold Coast when it comes to Australian cities which now have an operational light rail, but didn't have a tram network earlier on. With much of Canberra's urban expansion occurring during the 1960s, a road network was developed with wide alignments, high speeds and divided carriageways, like the Tuggeranong Parkway. This has some drawbacks, especially for pedestrians who need to cross said roads, but one benefit of a wide alignment is it makes it much easier to retrofit infrastructure, like a light rail network. Prior to my recent trip, I last travelled to Canberra in January 2017, when the light rail was in its early stages of construction, the rapid bus network was much smaller than it is today, and there were a lot more high-floor Renault buses out and about. I also remember it taking me much longer than 25 minutes to get to Kungarlan. Unfortunately, I don't have time or the knowledge to go through a full history of Canberra and its planning, transport and development today, but what I can say is that the light rail will continue to play a big part in the city's development, and I am glad to see a public transport network that might start to transform the car-based narrative that has been pursued for the past century. Hopefully, the Stage 2 connection to Woden will transform the network to having a high-frequency light rail spine service, with buses performing a feeder service function, offering a fast, efficient and easy-to-use connection that can provide a true alternative to driving throughout the city. Now arriving at MacArthur Avenue, please exit through the left-hand side doors. And by then, the bus fleet might even be fully accessible too. It does still surprise me to see 30-year-old high-floor Renault buses roaming the capital, even if there are only about three dozen left. And with that, it's time to let one of these 14 fabulous trams depart and say thanks for joining me and I will see you again soon. Thank you.